All right. Hello, everyone. So I'm not Loic. Loic is here next to me. I'm Sebastian. I have the chance to lead the 3D division at Adobe, and I wanted to make the introduction to Loic today. He's coming from uh, Asobo Studio uh, back in uh, France, and uh, Asobo is very famous for Flight Sim, I guess, and before that, Fuel. Uh, but Loic today is uh, here to talk about uh, a Plague Tale Requiem and making uh, AAA uh, characters with AA budget. budget. <laughs> there you go. Enjoy. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Loic. I'm a senior character artist at uh, Azobo Studio. And today I will tell you all about how we made uh, AAA looking characters for Plague Tale Requiem uh, with a double A budget. So, for those of you who have maybe never heard of the game, uh, Plague Tale Requiem. It's an action adventure game uh, set in France during the 14th century, so during the Black Plague, and you play as Amicia and her little brother uh, Hugo as they flee hordes of man-eating rats uh, while trying to find a cure for uh, Hugo's blood disease. But let me just show you a trailer to give you a better idea of what the game looks like. Bloody brambles! This is your tower! It's evil! You're going too fast for me! Please, Mother said to try to yeah, exhaust him. Yeah. Of course, from now on, we need to isolate him. You want to lock him away? Do you know what your brother is capable of? Hugo is condemned. The last threshold means the death of the carrier. It's starting all over again. Not starting. Spreading. Hugo. Hugo, my brother needs your help, and the rats are already there! Control your flame protector. Others are burned in it. The island! It's where I must go! It's where I will be fixed, Amicia! I will do what's good for you. I will. I'm not ready for this! No one could be ready for this. This is a constant reminder that I should kill you. I know where your island is. Keep me alive until we get there. By the way, this land is under the Count's law. Be nice. Feel free to enjoy Lacuna. Brighter days are the best time for it. Fuck it. I don't need you. What is wrong with me? You'll end up wanting to kill me too. What happened? It's... the rats. This world hurts. And it keeps hurting. And you want to hurt it back. But it's a fight you can't win in this. They don't die! They are dead! Who do you think you are to defy me? I'm Amicia Jeroen! All right, so, uh, so Plague Tale Requiem is the sequel to uh, Plague Tale Innocence, which released back in uh, 2019. Uh, we made it uh, with a pretty small team of 45 people over uh, three years. And upon release, well, we were quite happy to, uh, well, it was praised for its story, music, uh, as well as uh, art direction. So the game would take you from beautiful sceneries like this one to end up uh, in some kind of rat-infested apocalypse uh, toward the end. And you would meet uh, along the way uh, quite a wide cast of characters, some nice, other not so much. And uh, when we decided to... Um, make a sequel, uh, we knew that we really had to step it up when it came to the visuals, uh, because, well, when you make a sequel, this is what uh, people expect. Uh, but fortunately, um, there was a lot of room for improvement, basically, uh, especially when it came to characters. We, uh, sometimes the facial anatomy was not so on point, uh, some textures were for some time blurry, um, and there wasn't much uh, facial animation. And uh, so for the vertical slice, we decided uh, that we needed a quality benchmark for the, uh, for the characters. Uh, so this is why uh, our art director basically uh, made a, an improved version of Amicia to give us an idea of what we were aiming for for the, the whole game. And this is what he came up with. So basically, uh, she has a higher poly count for her face. Uh, she has better skin details. Uh, we started working with textures XYZ. Uh, we improved the anatomy because, as you can see, uh, 
Uh, in Innocence, Amicia's face is a bit stylized, which would sometimes uh, clash with the realistic environments. And she finally had better blend shapes for animation. And yeah, so basically, we wanted better looking characters. But not only that, we wanted more of them. Uh, this is basically the, um, the scope of the character art of Requiem. There's like uh, 10 main characters. Some of them have, have multiple outfits, so it adds up quite quickly in uh, production time. Um, there's uh, around 20 secondary characters, and by this I mean characters that only appear um, in cinematics, but also uh, soldiers and enemy enemies, basically. And uh, around 60 crowd NPCs. I'll talk a bit more about those uh, in a minute. And also uh, many animals, corpses, statues, things like that. So basically we wanted better looking characters, more of them, basically more of everything. Uh, but the only thing we didn't have more of is, uh, well, character artists. Um, <laughs> on the first game, we were two character artists, and uh, we decided to still stay just two character artists for Requiem. So it's just me and uh, my colleague, uh, Adonia Orient. Um, so even though the, the whole team grew from 45 people to 75, it was still the two of us. But fortunately, um, we had help from um, our art director, Olivier Ponsonnet. Uh, he basically made everything around Amicia. Um, he made uh, her face, hair, all of our outfits. He even made uh, her blend shapes. Yeah, it was a tremendous help. And also, for six months, we had a character artist intern, Antoine Detailleur, who basically helped by making, uh, well, again, corpses, animals, uh, assets that we would see in close-up uh, during cinematics. And uh, because we are a small team we uh, and we wanted to make uh, such a big game, uh, we had to find ways to speed up productions. So here's a few of them that I will uh, explain in detail. So first off is uh, taking advantage of the Substance 3D Assets library, then favoring detailing in Substance 3D uh, Painter, uh, creating flexible assets, easy NPC crowd variations, and faster skin painting. So the first one, uh, taking advantage of the 3D uh, assets library. Uh, so we often use patterns when uh, designing characters to make uh, their outfits uh, more interesting. So for example, uh, in these two concepts of uh, Sophia on the left and Countess Emilia on the right, uh, it gives you a, an idea of the, let's say, the, the two kinds of patterns that we, uh, we usually get when we receive uh, the concept art. So in this case, uh, those are pretty well-defined patterns. On the left, uh, you can see that it's easy to understand. It's very easy for us to just make a clean version of the pattern in maybe Photoshop and then use it in Painter. On the right, it's even a, a better example uh, basically, the, the concept artist um, did, all the, did all the job. All I had to do is open his PSD file, take the pattern, use it on the character. However, it's not always as easy because sometimes the patterns are not well defined. It's not, uh, well, I just cannot take it as is. Uh, the, in, the intention is there, but uh, I basically would have to completely remake the patterns from scratch, which takes time. and. We don't have much of it. So uh, this is where the library comes in pretty handy, especially for patterns, uh, because they are ready to use. There's many dif different uh, of them. And they are licensed. Really, that's basically the best part, to be honest. Uh, so just let me give you an example. So for example, uh, for Sofia, uh, that was made uh, by Mokula Gadonia. Uh, for her bandana and scarves, um, she basically used uh, those, um, those two materials. Uh, in a way, uh, she basically cut up parts of uh, the material to, to basically uh, create something new that fit her need. And um, such complex patterns would have taken way longer to make, uh, but by using the library, it was uh, fast and easy. Same thing for the scarf, uh, it's even even more straightforward. Again, uh, it's a tremendous um, time saver to, to pick up your patterns uh, in the library. Uh, next up is favoring detailing in Painter. So it's very important to understand when uh, it's a good idea to detail uh, in your uh, high-poly sculpt 
and when it is to make them uh, on your low poly. So the, the two ways of working are, um, well, they're, they're, they have their pros and cons. So basically, in the perfect world, you would do everything on your high poly, but uh, because of things like uh, uh, well, the, the design is sh sure to change or uh, you don't have enough resolution, you don't have enough time, so most of yeah, the bigger problem is you don't have the time to do everything on your high poly. And sure, the, um, uh, with uh, all your details in your high poly, you get uh, better bakes with uh, more details in your ambient occlusion and curvature maps. But it's always a better idea to do all this work uh, in, directly in your texture, in Painter, because it's, well, it's faster, for obviously, uh, than, uh, rather than sculpt it in, uh, in ZBrush, but it's way easier to iterate uh, but let me just uh, give you a, a few examples. So uh, here is a concept art that was made by uh, our art director of uh, an outfit for Amicia. And it's a good example because um, uh, our concept art are usually um, not always the, um, the end result. They're, they're usually uh, just a stepping stone to give you an idea where to go next in the design. Uh, because uh, we always favor um, working on the final, uh, you know, the final asset in the game to give you the actual ID. So in this one, uh, you can tell that it's a very rough uh, concept art. And because I guess uh, our art director was not too sure where to go with the character. And uh, making details and patterns on the final model, uh, it's way easier to basically try stuff like uh, pattern on the pattern on the belt, the pattern on the, the corset, things like that, that would be uh, way harder to iterate uh, if you had done uh, them uh, directly in the high poly. Um, same thing here on this concept art of Hugo. Uh, when you have complex pattern like this, it's always a better idea uh, to just make the high poly without and work it um, on, the, on the low poly model to really give you a, so that you, you have, have a final idea of what you're working with basically. Or again, uh, when you work with concept art that is not like uh, super well defined, like uh, here on the scarf, mm. When I first looked at it, I was not too sure. You can't really tell what the pattern is. Uh, are those stars, uh, are they evenly spaced? Look, I'm not too sure. But at Asobo Studio, uh, as a character artist, you're supposed to, uh, you know, you use, use common, your common sense as an artist and uh, look, uh, interpret the, the concept art as you think is best. But when working this way, uh, sometimes it could happen that uh, you should have final result to your art director and it doesn't work out. And you really don't want to have to go back to your high poly. Uh, the best solution is to really uh, change it like on the spot in, it, it, it takes only 30 seconds in, in Painter to change this kind of uh, detail. And this way you can really uh, work it out with your art director and hey, do things better or not. Uh, so it be bigger or smaller, evenly spaced. Or, so yeah, uh, it really helps uh, to find um, the, the correct design easily uh, by just being uh, more flexible, basically. Uh, so next step is uh, creating flexible assets. Uh, because um, we are such a small team, the character artists are in charge of uh, the more organic uh, assets uh, in the game, uh, like uh, well, corpses, uh, statues, things like that. However, making a, a character and making an environmental asset is completely different because the environment are much more prone to change. Uh, because they have to, to work with the level designer, uh, they have to work with uh, the game designer. The, the game designer will sometimes uh, change the level, but more often than not, it's the story that will um, completely change the level. And because we are a story-driven game, uh, the artist uh, will really do everything they can to help sell the story. So if it takes uh, sometimes completely changing the level, well, we, we do it. So we need to be very flexible when, uh, when making assets. 
And uh, when texturing, we like to prioritize uh, working with generators. So to, to give you a better example, uh, this is a concept art of a later le level in the game uh, that we call uh, the giant rat nest. Uh, basically, uh, rats uh, dragged underground hundreds of corpses to build their nest. And uh, of course, the character artists uh, have to make those corpses. Um, so we asked our intern to make uh, a first pass of um, the asset we needed. And look, he did a great job. There's tons of details. Uh, he didn't overdo it because it's important to remember it's not a character, it's an environment asset. So you don't put, uh, put as much time in it. Texturing, uh, texturing is great too. But again, the story changed. Uh, it turns out now this uh, rat nest is 600 years old and it doesn't really work out with this uh, asset because uh, it looks like it's been dead for like a week, not uh, six centuries. So we, we had to rework it. And when we are confronted to this kind of situation, uh, we always like to work in a way, uh, if, you, if you don't have to make, look, n never make something new, make, uh, use what you already have. So I worked, uh, I took basically a sculpt and reworked it to, uh, to make it look well, way more, uh, way older, way, way more ancient, like it, uh, even almost fossilized, mummified. And uh, when it came to the texturing, uh, things were reused too. So, um, uh, because he worked with a uh, generator, it was very easy to uh, just take his uh, painter file. Actually, uh, it's, it's the same thing. The bone texture is the same. The gut uh, texture is the same too. It's just assigned differently. And it was basically ju just a, a drag and drop of his files. Uh, it, and I think it took uh, basically like half a day to remake the asset. And here's the final result um, in the right nest. Uh, a better view of uh, how the, the corpses work uh, to, to create a, a nice silhouette where you can see hands and grumming at the, the sky, things like, uh, things like that. And as I said before, we always uh, like to uh, reuse as much as we can uh, to work faster. So for example, a few months later, one of my colleagues is, uh, is in need of creating a, a mass grave and we only have um, bones and skull assets. So it's, it's quite hard to sell uh, the, the fantasy that it's uh, a mass grave. And instead of uh, creating new assets, well, again, just reuse, just reuse what you have. Let's just take those uh, old mum uh, mummified uh, corpses that we made. And with just like two layers, you get a, like a fresh corpse that looks great um, in a mass grave like this. So yeah, it's important to be very flexi flexible, reuse as much as what you have before even thinking about, about creating something new to be, uh, well, to be faster. Um, up next um, is easy crowd variation. So crowds uh, was a very new thing for us uh, in Requiem because in, in, in a sense there's like one crowd in the game and there's like five NPCs in it. Um, and that's, that's not what we needed for uh, Requiem because um, we wanted Amicia and Hugo to go through uh, places like uh, a medieval market, um, um, uh, a pilgrim encampment, uh, uh, a village island. So all those places need to feel uh, well lived in. Uh, so with NPCs and uh, and a lot of them. Uh, unfortunately, because there's just uh, two characters, uh, we thought, okay, let's outsource them. But we didn't. Uh, we don't have. Mo we didn't have much of an outsourcing budget. So we thought, oh, okay. So how about we outsource just a few uh, NPCs? and then create variations just by creating new textures. So um, this is uh, the concept art that we sent uh, to the outsourcers. So as you can see, uh, when they made the, uh, the, the concept, they really thought first about uh, uh, creating a, a lot of uh, different silhouettes and not worrying too much uh, about the co colors because this is the, we would, um, 
create those variation uh, ourselves. Um, same thing when it came to the women, lots of trying to add variety through silhouette before uh, before color, because basically uh, that's what we wanted to uh, to do. Just from one uh, asset created from the art sources, creating at least two two new ones, but just changing, uh, you know, swapping the colors, um, swapping hair, hats, and it kind of worked well uh, at first. So those are uh, this is the first batch that was made by the outsourcers. It's like um, 17 characters. Of course, that's not enough to create the, the crowds that we wanted because in the the bigger the biggest crowd in the game uh, is like 80 characters in the same space. So 17 is not enough at all. And just by uh, creating uh, new textures, we brought it up to. Um, 28 characters, but again, that is not enough. And the thing is, uh, basically the game is uh, divided in two big chunks. The first chunk of the game is set in Provence, which is the south of uh, France, and we that we would call then the, the mainland. And then uh, the other half of the game is set on, a, on an island in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and we thought, okay, how about uh, all the NPCs uh, on the island have a completely uh, different uh, color scheme to to make it so that the player, when they switch uh, to the island, really feel like they are they're in a new world. So yeah, just by uh, creating this new scheme or color scheme of uh, you know, uh, it's just basically red, uh, beige, and brown, and just characters with dark with darker skin. Uh, we we could go up to something like uh, 50 new characters. Uh, yet again, just with textures uh, variations. And there, but there was missing something because just the variety just through uh, different colors uh, doesn't work enough. You actually need variety too in uh, in heights actually. So this is why we uh, outsource to uh, basically uh, teenagers and kids. And this uh, really this different in height really uh, really help uh, set this crowd as actual crowds, actual uh, living uh, people. And the cool things with the kids is that they have completely different animations from the adults who would just well work and do their normal adult things. When kids would just play around, sit uh, sit on the floor, which would again create some more uh, variety in the crowds and make it more believable. And uh, we also had sourced uh, monks and nuns because basically uh, they are they are quite a staple of the medieval age. I think people accept, uh, expect to see them. Uh, in those games, so and you know, it adds a bit of variety. So here is uh, what it looks like actually uh, an actual crowd uh, of the mainland, and um, a crowd uh, on the island. So as you can see, we, we go more in uh, in the browns and reds, and it feels completely different from the mainland, even though it's basically the same characters over and over. Uh, so that's that's it for the crowd. And my favorite part, faster skin painting. So I I, I do a breakdown of Amicia's texturing. Uh, then um, I talk a bit uh, how we texture secondary characters uh, and how it de differs from um, texturing main characters. And then I give you some tips for uh, for speeding up uh, skin painting. And I do a live demo. Uh, so first of all, those are the basic br brush that we use uh, on all our characters. So the, the basic soft is super useful for uh, small details like uh, scratches, but also uh, for blocking out uh, uh, the main colors. Uh, then the dirt tree uh, for uh, adding small no noise in the skin, but also for bigger details like uh, freckles and you know liver spot, things like that. The cracks brush is uh, surprisingly super useful for um, small veins, like uh, on Messias' wound here, but also um, on the lower eyelid or around uh, the nostrils. And then uh, the dirt tool brush, um, which is really useful uh, because it's a bit random and to uh, you know uh, add in your uh, different um, color tones, it's really useful. 
So the breakdown of Amicia's skin painting. Uh, so we begin all our characters the same way, uh, with a base of ambient occlusion and uh, a projected base from uh, XYZ textures. Except for Amicia, our art director chose to uh, work in a bit of a different way. Uh, because she's a character uh, recurrent from the first game, he decided to uh, build the texture on top of the old one, like at 50%. To, in, in an idea to you know, keep continuity of the look of the character. And as you can see, uh, the ambient occlusion is not, str uh, it's not strong at all. Uh, the, we kept a bit uh, in the nostrils, uh, the, uni the inner corner of the eye and um, in, uh, in the ears. So we don't want it to be too strong in the diffuse because um, um, our ambient occlusion on faces is actually added uh, during the uh, uh, um, screen space ambient occlusion pass. Uh, it's, act uh, it's actually combined with a baked ambient occlusion, and we don't want it to be added on top of uh, the uh, of, uh, already baked ambient occlusion in the diffuse. And the neat things with uh, having the ambient occlusion in the SSIO pass is that uh, it disappears when there's direct light, to, well, to give um, a more realistic, realistic uh, feeling uh, to the faces. So that's the base. Next up is blocking uh, the red and blue tones of the skin, uh, reds uh, in the, the lips, around the eyes, uh, the cavities of the ears, the cheeks, and uh, blue tones, um, again, uh, around the eye sockets and the inner corner of the eyes. Uh, next up, is adding the small details. So those are quite subtle, uh, like um, using the, the cavity map to mark the skin pores in red, um, adding freckles, um, things like uh, with a, a blue brush, uh, drawing uh, blue veins uh, on the temples, uh, as well as adding small wounds uh, here and there. And uh, I, I, uh, in the diffuse, uh, all these little scratches and not very visible, but they're not supposed to be visible in the diffuse because you can see in the left they are a lot more visible because of the roughness and um, and the normal map. But I'll talk a bit more about that uh, in a minute. Then is adding a uh, painting the hair directly in the diffuse. So we liked to uh, still paint hair directly in the diffuse uh, because it helps a lot to uh, create a smoother uh, transition between uh, well, the texture of the face uh, and hair and the actual uh, hair cards. And uh, it's a bit of, of an old school way to work, uh, but it works. So uh, that's why we keep, uh, we keep it that way. And then it's all the, all the special details like uh, here, the um, Amicia's wound. Um, a pretty cool touch here is the um, directional blur on the um, on the blood on her face, which uh, is a bit of some kind of uh, st storytelling through uh, the, the the face texture. You can really feel like Amicia hit her face on the ground and it really scratched her. And I think it's a neat touch, you know, uh, storytelling through the textures. And so that's pretty much for the diffuse. But most of uh, the things that pop in the face come from um, really working on uh, your roughness uh, because we really want to, to break up uh, this, uh, the reflection the, on our face so that it's not just a, a white spot. And um, the measure break uh, comes from, uh, of course, the, the normal map, but also um, uh, by using your cavity to add uh, some uh, some some spots with less reflection, so to break up the to break it up, um, and then adding adding uh, by hand some uh, lower flatness details like uh, scratches. That you, as I said, you can notice them. Uh, you cannot notice them in the diffuse, but they really pop because of the uh, the changes in roughness. And as you may have noticed. Um, the, there is some spots that were painted uh, in white, like um, the inner, uh, the inside of the nose, uh, or the or the um, the lower eyelid, or uh, inside the mouth. Uh, we do this just uh, so that we don't get any uh, 
any parasitic uh, reflection, you know, when you have a pretty bright uh, light uh, from uh, behind the character, in some games uh, you can see that uh, the inside of their mouth uh, light up. Uh, and we do this to avoid uh, this kind of thing. Uh, but there's uh, you also on the lower lip, you can tell that um, uh, our art director chose to um, add some uh, low roughness uh, spots that are not physically correct. But sometimes uh, I like this kind of stuff because he just did it because uh, it looked better to um, to make uh, the um, the reflection a bit uh, narrower. Uh, so I like this kind of stuff because it's not physically correct, but it looks better. And uh, I think it's important to keep this in mind uh, when you're making uh, characters in video games. I know that um, uh, now uh, render rendering in for video games is really incredible. And uh, we could say physically correct sometimes, but physically correct, it's not always the what looks best. And this covers, this covers most of Amicia's um, texturing. And I'd like to talk a bit uh, more about uh, how we work on secondary characters. So secondary characters are, are characters that appear just in, um, in cinematics for like, some of them appear for just like 20 seconds. And, uh, but we still have to put in some work in them because uh, they are right next to Amicia, who uh, looks really great. And we cannot have a character that just looks average uh, because just by comparison, it's gonna look like it's gonna look really bad. So we still have to put in the work, and of course you want to put as much work in a character as the character is gonna appear in game. Uh, so that's a bit of a dilemma, and we cannot really outsource those characters uh, because we would rather keep um, all the faces done uh, in intern. Uh, be uh, well because uh, they change a lot actually. Uh, especially those uh, secondary characters, um, uh, because um, like the story changes a lot on smaller details toward the end of uh, production, and like for example, I had to change a character from some tall, bald brute in his forties to a teenager to fit uh, the again the story, or age some young woman to an old one. And look, you, you cannot waste time uh, in. Uh, uh, in making new assets like this. Um, so, for example, when, when working on this character, I realized that basically when I texture skins, I do the same process pretty much exactly between every character. It's always ambient occlusion plus cavity, then a projected base uh, from uh, texture XYZ, and then uh, the paint over to add in the correct uh, color tones. Um, and when, in, uh, in video games, when you start making the same thing over and over again, uh, it's time to, to find the smarter way to do it and to uh, automatize it. And um, the part that would take the longer is uh, projecting uh, the base. So the thing is, uh, we actually use the same uh, UVs between every character in the game. Uh, it is this way because, uh, well, um, every, ca every character has the same face topology and the same uh, vertex ID. So it's mainly used by our technical animators to, uh, to transfer between characters things like uh, blend shape and skinning. But because they also have the same uh, UVs, it allows me to, um, to use actually the same, uh, the same um, projected te texture between every character. So basically, I, I created uh, this uh, smart material that I used on every single character in the game, like uh, men, women, children, everyone. And uh, it allows me to be way faster because I don't have to recreate um, the whole thing from scratch every time. So it, it has all I need, like the ambient occlusion plus cavity, um, all the layers I usually uh, use for facial hair, then a basic roughness that just uses the uh, cavity and, and things like that. Um, for, my, for my paint over, I, I usually always use the same color, so my basic setup and the projected base. Uh, but let me show you uh, how it looks, uh, how, how I actually work uh, with, this, uh, with this kind of stuff uh, in Painter. 
So, okay. So here's uh, three phases uh, that you you meet in the game. And so basically, this is uh, how I would work everything uh, with every single phase. Uh, I would just drag and drop my smart material. So it gives you a really useful uh, base to start to start from. And as you can see, it gives you a, a roughness that yeah, it's pretty, uh, it's usable, it's fine. It still needs more work. Um, and it, 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 uh, it also works uh, with uh, characters that have a uh, facial anatomy that is very, uh, very different, like uh, on this one. There we go. Again, gives us a, a nice roughness, even uh, helps us with uh, the cavity details. And it's also useful uh, with uh, characters with a more subtle um, look like uh, women and children. So this is uh, Beatrice's face, uh, but because the uh, the base uh, projected uh, texture is uh, from a man, I uh, I have a second set of uh, texture. If I can, yeah, there we go. Does not want to. Okay. Okay. All right. So yeah, so that's the base used for uh, women uh, and children. Uh, so of course, uh, it's a good base, but uh, there's still a lot to uh, to make. So let me just show you um, how I would usually work, um, how I would start a new texture. So let's work uh, just with Milo's head. So this is the base that we get just from the smart material. Uh, and at this point, I usually uh, just start painting up. Let me grab a stylus. OK. So first thing, uh, as you can see, uh, that's the problem with uh, using the same base for, for everyone. Uh, you're going to have uh, stretches in your projected base. Uh, so it's easily corrected. Uh, go, not here. Sorry, it's a bit of a technical difficulty. There we go. So how I would usually work. Oh. Oh. Damn. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, OK, I get my brushes. OK, there we go. Uh, I would just pick. Uh, okay. Um, you know what? <laughs> Let's just skip to uh, actually um, just the, the painting. But just now, you have to uh, to paint over all those stretches um, in the projected base before actually uh, working uh, in. Uh, uh, so. Uh, like I said earlier, we like to work with the dirt brushes for our base. And uh, when you're working, uh, when you're starting uh, your, oh my God, yes. okay. So yeah, when you start putting in your colors, uh, don't be shy to be to go really strong with the reds and uh, things like that. Um, because, for example, because Milo, oh, the character's name is Milo, it's a pirate, uh, it's a good idea to uh, really think about uh, storytelling, even when you are uh, texturing your character. So let's just, yeah, yeah, let's just imagine that it's a Milo, uh, he's a pirate. 
he'll be he drinks a lot, I'm sure. Um, so let's go really hard with the red. I'm gonna tone down, of course, a little bit when I know that I've got what I need. Um, and then, like I said earlier, it's nice to add uh, to use the crack uh, brush to put in some veins up there like this. I'm gonna turn it down because I'm sure it's a lot. Same a bit here around the eyes. And uh, like I said, uh, you sh shouldn't be shy uh, when painting uh, your colors uh, because it may look like really strong when you're working in Painter, but you have to remember that uh, the final product in the video game with the lighting and, uh, and things like that, uh, the, pro the post process, uh, your skin painting is really gonna be toned down and uh, all those things that uh, look uh, really uh, harsh to you won't be uh, super noticeable. So let's add a bit of the blues. There we go. Again, really, let's go really hard at first and then turn it down. Up, up, up. Um, I like to also block in very quickly uh, things like um, the beard. So uh, I have everything I need already set up. Um, so I like to first draw a five o'clock shadow to give us There we go. Just to give us an idea of where the beard should be. Up. There we go. And quickly just turn it down. All right. And then uh, use my uh, layer of Fosterbos to quickly add in uh, with the dirt tree. It works well too. Uh, and there we go, so, super easily to give us some details. Uh, up, up, up. It's a bit too strong here with the five o'clock shadow. Let's again turn it down. Yeah, like this. Let's get back here. Up, up, up. And there we go. Uh, I really use uh, the stubbles to create a transition with uh, your hair cars. Like I said, the guy, he doesn't have hair, but it's useful that way. And uh, with a bit uh, more work, like not so much, uh, you can get, uh, let me give you up an ID with, okay, with some uh, like less than half an hour, you can get something like this that looks, uh, you know, um, natural that you can use uh, uh, already in the game so that uh, the environment artist can start, uh, well, uh, lighting your, um, your cinematics, things like that. And, uh, you know, Every, everyone can move on and start uh, building around the character. And um, so with, uh, with a few more hours of work, oh, excuse me, uh, I'll try to start from the, uh, <laughs> okay, I just read this way. I'm not uh, very versed in, uh, in PowerPoint. And with some more, more work in uh, our engine. So this is what uh, the character would look like. And um, yeah, that's it uh, for this talk. Uh, I thank you very much for your attention. And uh, does anybody have uh, any question? <laughs> Uh, 
Hello. Um, I actually do have a question. Yes. Um, I noticed you're painting with a tablet. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was actually using Substance Painter last night for a certain project, but the problem was I was having some trouble baking certain textures like ambient occlusion, etc. And the problem it presented with me was a lack of GPU space. Do you? Uh, yeah. I don't, I wouldn't <laughs> I'm say not that's too a, sure to, uh, if I understand your question. Uh, my, my question is like, is there, when working with something that has low GPU, and you want to get certain textures that may require a little more with it, you know, with baking high tech, high texture, high meshes and stuff. Okay. Do you have any ways to compensate for that? Okay, so yeah, you mean when you work with a low end ma uh, machine uh, and you want to really have uh, details in your texture? Okay. Yes. Well, what I would do is work, you know, uh, actually uh, in really low. Um, uh, texture size like uh, 512 and you know uh, because uh, most of the texturing is procedural in a uh, painter uh, when you bring it back up to, to 2048 all those details are actually going to appear um, I'm not sure it's going to work well uh, with the, uh, your actual painting but it could work still but yeah working in low res resolution and then bringing it back up to uh, 2k before exporting could work uh, in this kind of situation how exactly would you bring it up back to 2K? Oh, but when you define the, uh, the size of your texture in Painter, uh, or even uh, in the uh, export parameters, you can just you can tell it to export, uh, even if the, your file is in 5.12, to export it uh, in 2K. You don't even have to change it. Uh, it uh, just the magically file. goes back up to 2K? Oh, yeah, that's why it's... It's, 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 that's why it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can, you can. That's uh, one of the main advantage of working uh, with Painter. Um, okay. Uh, all the procedural stuff, you can bring back uh, from five thousand to two k or whatever size you want. Perfect. Thank you. I think you saved my homework assignment. <laughs> Great. <clears throat> uh, hello. Yes. Uh, so my question is, with uh, such a small art team, when you presented you and your crew, did you and your artists had to double as technical artists as well, or was, or did you guys actually had a second team as well? Uh, uh, so that's a good go? question. Yeah, yeah because uh, yes, because uh, we are such a small team, most of us uh, have to to do much more than just our job, uh, just for our specialization. So uh, for the first game, yes, we had to do stuff like. Um, um, like uh, that's not the fun part, but skinning stuff like that, uh, skeleton setup. So yes, um, most of us have to do way more than what we uh, are specialized in. That's how it works. <laughs> Interesting. Thank you. Bonjour Loïc. Bonjour. <laughs> On your left. <laughs> ah, <sorry. laughs> well, not that good of a ventriloquist. Uh, you talk about uh, projection in XYZ. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about more about that? Uh, is that from photos or from unpainted textures? Yeah, so texture XYZ is a site who sells uh, super high resolution skin textures and much more than that. And we use it uh, so as uh, our base that we we pro so yeah we use uh, high definition skin uh, texture to project and project them uh, in painter but we mostly use it uh, for um, uh, skin pore details on the sculpt in zbrush so yeah that's mainly how we use uh, those textures okay thank you Hi, uh, I was just very interested with the amount of textures and unique characters that you're creating. What was your process for keeping all of that texture information um, basically in, um, uh, pardon my words, like how did you, how did you structure all of that to keep everything organized for your team? Uh, you mean uh, to uh, to keep it like uh, like as you were building it and like kind of archiving it for like the team and then you know utilizing it through the rest of the project? How what was your process for you know like creating it, keeping it you know well organized and then able to you know pass it along or just kind of kick it back and forth? Uh, okay, so that's very interesting because we don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the thing is, Rockstar because answer, there's Rockstar just uh, two character artists, we sit ne next to each other all the time. I know what my colleague has done. She knows where, what I do. She knows where everything is. Uh, we know how we work. So um, of course, with a way bigger team, 
you 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 have to organize. Uh, but uh, you know that we, we we work as if we are we were a small studio. But uh, yes, but we have no problem finding uh, our stuff. Like you know, that's like having a messy room. I know where is the stuff. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's not messy. I know where it is. Where it is. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, uh, you can go. Oh, so, so earlier you mentioned that many NPCs have like the same UVs, which allow the textures to be transferred over. Mm. So, like, how do you take into a? So, if like if two different NPCs have like the different like sculpts, different like facial, have like different blend shapes, won't that won't that in theory cause like distortions for when the textures are projected onto the mesh? So. Um... Uh, most of the NPCs actually they have their own texture. Um, we played around a bit by switching texture between NPCs to like creating new faces. But most of the NPCs uh, they have their own their own textures without distortions. And you talked about the blend shapes. NPCs don't have blend shapes really. Uh, all they have uh, is like uh, you know automatic lip sync, but no blend shapes anyway. So that wasn't really a problem. And it, even if there were any distortions, it's fine because uh, most of the NPCs don't talk. Uh, we only see a few of them in uh, in uh, cinematics, and those NPCs we rework them to so that they are top notch. So uh, that wasn't really a problem. Hey, just a couple of questions. Uh, would you recommend personally to bake ambient occlusion in Substance or a different uh, program? Uh, it was re really great in uh, in Painter. I mean, the main advantage is that you don't have to uh, change uh, software uh, when you you know when you update your high poly. It's it's really useful this way. Uh, I also like to use a Marmoset uh, Marmoset toolbag for uh, for our bakes because you can uh, very easily um, uh, change the um, the projecting cage stuff like that. So it really is up to to your taste. I think uh, the um, these two solutions work really great. All right, and uh, you said also that every does every single face in this game have the exact same topology. <laughs> Excuse me, could you repeat the right. question? Um, did you say that every single face has the exact same topology, or is it only the NPCs? Uh, no, no, even uh, even the no, every main character, every NPC uh, uses the same base. Actually, uh, we start uh, sculpting uh, every character from the same base mesh, hmm. and then when we're done uh, sculpting the face, we use the subdivision one as the low poly of the face. So you know, there's no retopology and don't have to to remake, remake the UVs. Um, so yeah, it's it's super useful. Everyone should do this. So if you have many characters in your game, share the same topology, same UVs. It's a time saver. All right, and uh, one more thing, just real quick. Uh, you said you had ambient occlusion curves details. How do you get curve detail on your model? Uh, when I talked about the um... the base mesh of your character. Well, I talked about ambient occlusion that we use in the the SSAO render pass, but uh, we don't we actually don't um, use much ambient occlusion in the in the diffuse anyway. So okay, sounds good. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, hi, um, I'm over here. Oh, <laughs> it's always <laughs> this is a really bright light from the left, so. <laughs> Understandable. Um, so I'm more of a beginner level developer, um, but I was just kind of wondering what is the software that you use to like paint on the textures? And um, like a follow up question to that is like, what are like good softwares you would recommend for like a beginner character artist to kind of get into to start learning the fundamentals? So you mean just just for texturing or more than that? Well, that's the thing. I kind of, I'm kind of unsure of how many even softwares you even use during this process. Um, so, well, so basically, uh, mainly uh, working with uh, ZBrush, uh, Painter, and your and Blender. I think you're pretty covered. Just with those three softwares to make characters that's uh, the lowest uh, you, you you need. Got you. Okay. Um, and are those like good softwares to start learning if you want to get into like character design and art and whatnot? Um, well, I think you should learn uh, on the the software that are, that are used um, in the industry. 
because uh, that's what uh, usually uh, they ask you. Uh, but um, to, to learn on, if you want to keep it in one software, I think that working just in Blender is a great idea. Okay. Because it's free, so yeah. The, and there's tons of tutorials, which you don't have uh, on yeah. software as 3ds max well i don't know why yeah i've seen I, i've been working on a donut i think that's really popular <laughs> everyone has done the donut <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much for this hawk fish cool hello it's me again um <laughs> so i had some pretty quick fire questions so i wanted to have an idea and you have two character artists yeah. how many environment artists did you have in comparison uh, to there's 12 artists? environment artists so 12 versus two that's so unfair and uh, then yeah. In we would lose like, in a fight against all of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of the production timeline, I know you guys as character artists had a lot of work to do. Mm. How much time did you actually have to get your workload completed? And how much time were you putting in like each week to kind of get that workload done? Was so, it more so? Uh, how much time for uh, a bigger character, basically? Um, I'm just talking more about the whole, the whole process as the character artist in general. Like... How much time, how much production did, time did you have for the entire project? And okay. I guess, yeah, how much time it took to get so all the characters. So there was them. one year of pre-production and two years of production where we really, really made the characters. Um, a main character would take like uh, uh, a month and a half to two months. Uh, secondary characters like soldiers, things like that, two weeks. And um, if, 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 if this answers your, your question... Yeah, absolutely. That's good. <laughs> Thank Great. you so much. And uh, do we have, see, have some time? Okay, okay. One minute left. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I'll make this quick, but uh, what was the process behind creating Amicia's hair? Well, hey, I'm sorry, but okay, there is no secret for this. It's basically, um, uh, the, so the, the best texture is like uh, done in Photoshop, just painting for the hair. And um, the hair cards, and I'm sorry, but there is no secret. It's placed one by one. Uh, th there is no secret. If you want great hair, you have to spend time. Um, and things like uh, Amicia's hair uh, took many, many, many hours. So yeah, by hand, all of it. There is no secret, sorry. Uh, hi. My hi. question is also actually about hair cards. So OK, well, um, let's make the last one then. Sure. Last one. Okay, cool. So if you're trying to optimize your hair cards uh, and hair card placement for, say, if you're doing a crowd scene, do you build masks up underneath where you'd have, like, a large beard, or do you just do it all in hair cards and have that, like, transparency? Um, that's a complex one. Um, <laughs> Sorry. But yeah, for optimizing, yes, uh, we would, like, create uh, an opaque base at first. Um and uh, the, the thing is to, to work uh, very low poly at first to keep control as much as you can of your hair. So um, like keep, keeping a strand of hair uh, with just like 10 triangles and, you know, adding a, a turbo smooth or mesh smooth by, on top of it, I think is the best way to optimize uh, working with a lot of hair. So yeah, keeping it uh, as low poly as possible, it helps a lot. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, that's it. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. Uh,